Hi everybody, how are you? I hope this finds you safe and well. Thank you very much for diving into another week of soundtracking um, with me, Edith Bowman, where I get to explore two of my passions, film and music, with wonderful creative people from the world of music, film, TV. Um, it's been a really interesting couple of weeks, actually. I've been doing lots of interesting interviews for forthcoming episodes of the podcast with the likes of Ben Wheatley and Andy Stark, uh, Tyler Bates, Kate Shortland. Um, I'm very much looking forward to sitting down and talking to Kate Heron, uh, the director of Loki and her composer, Natalie Holt. Natalie's done so many great things that we've talked about actually on this podcast um, with Philippa Lothorpe. She did Three Girls. Um, there's a great new film up on Sky Cinema called Kindred. She did the score for that as well. So many great TV and big screen productions that she's also been part of the music team. So looking forward to sitting down to chat to Kate Heron and Natalie Holt together in the next couple of weeks. But our latest guest on soundtrack and is not only someone that I've known for a very long time, but also someone who's been, well, a massive supporter of this podcast since day one. So we have to thank him massively for that. Tom Hiddleston is currently tearing up the screens as Loki on Disney+. Plus. As you join me right now, I have one child at home. I'm waiting on the return of another child, my child, to uh, so that we can watch episode four. It's so good. And I love this whole weekly appointment to listen um, process that Disney Plus has been using since since they launched the service, really. And I think it's such a healthy and brilliant way to to make us all wait for new versions and editions and episodes of our new favourite TV shows. So Loki, as I said, is up on Disney+. Plus. It's a brilliant vehicle for one of, well, I think one of Marvel's most enduring characters and a welcome return after, <clears throat> spoiler alert, what happened in Avengers Infinity War. I mean, surely you've all seen it by now. Now, as well as discussing Natalie Holt's sonically adventurous score for the series, we also dive deep into Tom's passion for music and soundtracks and discover the song that he sang at his drama school audition. If you've been on my social media, then you will already know the answer to that question. But we will begin with one of Natalie's fantastic cues from Loki, The Archives. Hey! Hey! Oh, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm very well too. Thank you for asking. Yeah, really, really good. Nice to see you virtually. Yes, likewise. Thanks for doing this. What a pleasure! It was. It's amazing. I remember when you first, when you launched this podcast. Um, About forty-five five years, years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. And look at you. Look yeah, at you. Go, it's, it's, look at you now. We've missed two weeks since we launched back in August five years ago. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah which we're well. very proud of. But it's so great to have you on because I know that music is such a, well, as well as being a fan of music, music is, you know, from conversations that we've had, is an important tool and companion, I guess, for you. 100%. Yes. I don't know what I'd do without it. I don't know what any of us would do without it. <laughs> It's sometimes the, the, such a source of inspiration to me. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of in awe of it, really, as an art form mm. without straying too far into pretentiousness. Um, <laughs> I'm reminded of this is quote um, by, I think, a, an essayist called Walter Pater, who said, all art aspires to the condition of music, which sort of is to say mm. that basic music is that, that music is the peak and everybody else. I'm sure acting is, is really far down the pyramid, but we're all trying to get to the immediacy, the emotional immediacy that music can yeah. evoke, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's. Um, I remember interviewing this amazing um, young scientist called Zoe Cormier, who wrote this book called Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll. And mm. uh, she's, a, she's this kind of jungle scientist or gorilla scientist, as she calls herself. 
And she, uh, through her research as well, uh, and she talks a lot about it in the book, is music is the only thing that kind of connects both sides of the brain. So it is the, uh-huh. the only thing kind of in scientific terms. And if you uh-huh. did a cross section, like you say, of this kind of different uh, creative minds of their brain, you would very clearly see in someone who worked with and around music that their their left and right side of their brains were actually connected. It's amazing, amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. Right. I want to get into music in a second, but I want to talk. Well, I mean, it's part of the discussion. And um, I've watched the first two episodes of Loki and I watched it with the kids and we had such a great time oh, oh, right it's so it's just so it's so clever without kind of trying to be too clever it's so colorful it's it's different it's just so many brilliant brilliant things oh thank you thank you so much we we um we had an amazing team on this surrounded by uh, literally amazing people who work night and day for 18 months some possibly longer <laughs> just trying to crack, you know, crack, crack it and yeah. take this character who we all know has had a long history and try and find a new way of opening him up, open, excavating yeah. all these many different contradictory characteristics that he seems to contain. But it's a really fascinating new world that he's in. And I hope everyone finds it. It just gets more and more surprising. So. When did you know there was going to be a, a TV spinoff? It was quite, it was quite the, it was quite the month, I think. It was around April, May of 2018. And Mm. that was the same time that Avengers Infinity War had been released. And as everyone can remember, (laughs) the opening scene. Emotional times. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Uh, In the, you know, the beginning of that film, Loki meets his end. So I was kind of, I really thought my journey was over and, was getting ready to do other things. And then, um, and then I got the call from, from uh, Kevin Feige and Luis de Esposito saying, right, we're going to do six hours of Loki for Disney Plus. And I thought, wow, great. How? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, so that's how long I've known about it. And then that summer was a really enjoyable summer of, of, um, putting our heads together and thinking how, where to take him next and what to do with yeah. it. Uh, so yeah, it's been a long time. He's kind of got this amazing, he's, he's been this character that, you know, he's obviously part of this world, but with all the other, with the, you know, with your Thors and, and Iron Man's and stuff, they, we kind of know them and we know what they are capable of. I mean, mm. Taika definitely kind of switched it up with Ragnarok amazingly. Yes with Thor yeah. but I think that with with Loki he's just this character obviously the mischief thing but but you never know what he's going to do next and right. that must be such a thrilling thing as an actor in terms of you kind of have a blank canvas every time you get the chance to play him yeah it's it's in his it's in his DNA unpredictability mischief spontaneity chaos mm. and has been as long as the character's been in in human consciousness he's the trickster in Norse mythology and any mythology is this transgressive, disruptive, boundary crossing sort of being who, who kind of you can't trust, but maybe sometimes you need. And in those amazing old stories, occasionally at the 11th hour, when everyone else has run out of ideas, it's Loki who, who throws his hat in and, and is useful. <laughs> So it's cool. He'd always be, I imagine him in sort of normal life to be the person at the end of a, a night out who'd always has, who'd always have a great suggestion of somewhere else you could go yes, to kind of continue the party. Definitely. Yeah, he bring, <laughs> he, he, the party never stops at Loki, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I want to know, what do you think, um, what does he listen to? What kind of music does Loki listen to? That's a good question. Eclectic. I think it's an eclectic range uh, of hugely eclectic taste. I think he definitely enjoys a arousing um, <laughs> uh, classical yeah. arrangement, um, probably in celebration of himself or something. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but um, oh, I don't know. It's weird. I've listened to so many so many pieces of music in preparation to play him. Um, oh wow! Which is kind of like. And they really vary too. They're, they're, some of them are, are old soundtracks and some of them are things like, you know, listening to the, Ro- the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Um, give, us some, like, give us some specifics of things that you've listened to, if you don't mind. Sympathy for the Devil 
has <laughs> mischief in its rhythm, I think. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many a man's soul and faith. I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. I hope uh, I hope the Rolling Stones aren't offended by that. I think it's cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, totally. Uh, and what else? Then there's kind of, there's so much pathos in the character as well, which is, so you've got this exterior playfulness, um, but also kind of an interior vulnerability. And um, I have always kind of found that really interesting, going back to sort of listen to quite classical scores, classical pieces of music. For this, well, on this show, I used to play music on set all the time. And um, <laughs> because it was sort of such a fun way of, including everybody it, it kind of with what was going on in my head um and what what, I, what what the pace of the scene was or what the atmosphere of the scene was and and bless the crew for being so patient with me carrying around my little <laughs> portable spe- speaker um, Amazing. yeah on, sometimes i would play do you know there's a, there's a track from dunkirk called supermarine uh mm-hmm. on hans, hans in the soundtrack which has a an extraordinary and quite stressful p- propulsive momentum, which I think embodies the Christopher Nolan theme of time, time running out, this, this ticking clock. And, and, and the, the, the tick of the clock itself seems to be beating in, in double time. And it's the whole track just has this kind of really circular, stressful momentum, which raises the stakes. And, and because this is a series about the clock ticking, time running out, time matters, time travel, timelines, you know, jumping around time, it seems such an appropriate thing to play. Also in that film, there is, there is, uh, I'm obsessed with that soundtrack, as you know, but there are so many extraordinary, beautiful, elegant stretches where Hans Zimmer and Benjamin Wallfish uh, have almost elongated sections of Elgar's Enigma variations, which evokes such an array of different feelings and, and sometimes just putting that on in the morning if you're doing a quite a heavy scene or a soft scene is is a can can set the scene
There were days when I played the Pointer Sisters and we just got the party started. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, um, Nile Rogers was a feature uh, all the time. Oh, yeah. I could see Nile in the world, actually. Me he's too. Kind of, Nile yeah. Rogers is one of those, he never seems to age. He's like cryogenically frozen a bit, you know, and it's right. kind of like he, yeah. but, and, and when you, when he I've invented, watched him, it, he invented a sound. I think he invented a whole song. Yeah. And when he starts playing a set at a festival, it's kind of like, oh, and another one, and another one. And it's just uh, this hit after hit. And you're kind of yeah. like, oh my God, he's just yes. written every song that I've ever danced to. Right. <laughs> and and, and it's sort of, it stays in the, it's like you don't realize the influence. It's sort of, you've got, I want your love and all the stuff he did with Chic. listen to Daft Punk carefully enough, there he is again. Um, yeah. Daft Punk occasionally, you know, um, some of those tracks. This is a good period. set. This is a good yeah. set to be on. <laughs> like I said, the party never stops. With love. Yeah. <laughs> so. I am. Um, I love watching you and Owen together. Those scenes with Loki and Mobius are, are, are beautiful, even in the first two episodes. And I imagine that that's something that we see kind of develop even more as we watch as we watch the series. And when I was thinking about coming to you today, I kind of had this slightly sort of fantastical image of, of Mobius and Loki sitting in a bar and doing kind of karaoke together. And I was just yes. like, oh, that would be mate and obviously time being a big theme and it being some kind of i don't know cindy lopper time after time or something that they might try and attempt together i was just yeah it's my crazy sure. little mind of the way it works if i could, if I could turn back time turn back time <laughs> <laughs> oh. absolute, absolute classic um so many was that fun yeah. was that fun to have a kind of sort of partner to sort of you know to kind of play with in that way with those car with those two characters as well owen was amazing it was he's such an important character in this because Mobius, you know, Mobius is this analyst who works for the TVA, and the TVA is an organization that claims to govern the order of time, and they keep it in a linear, straight line according to some predetermined decision. And Mobius is um, academic and curious and intelligent, and on the page, I thought, I wonder how that's going to mm. kind of come to life, and then when I found out that it was that Owen was going to do it, it just all fell into place because he brought such warmth and this wry sense of humor to the character. And he's and it's such a confrontation for Loki because I think Mobius is the, perhaps the first character he's ever encountered who can see him without mm. judgment. There's no emotional involvement in, in whatever's going on for Loki. So it's really confusing. You know, all of Loki's tricks don't work on Mobius. And I guess they, they're a strange mirror for the other. And yeah, it was really fun. And, and, and we go on a, you'll see, we go on a big adventure together. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I almost, I felt like they were kindred spirits in a way because they mm. kind of Mobius, he doesn't, doesn't quite fit in there, yeah. you know, in terms of That's he's it. kind of, you know, he's, he's kind of, he's, he feels like he's got a concert. Yeah. 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 I like that kind of common ground. They seem to kind of, that I, I saw them finding with each other. I love the tone of it. The humor in it is brilliant as well. It's so, it's so unique. The whole thing, I think, and I'm so excited to watch the rest of it. I really, really am. Well, you know, it, we, I go to just talk about Kate Heron. Oh, um, Kate! I'm desperate to speak to Kate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just she, what a she's talent! Amazing. amazing. And so, when I first met her, just the passion and the preparation was was astonishing, and. 
we've made this for such a long time now and we had to kind of synchronize watches and her she has an extraordinary combination of diligence and energy and kindness because she's such a fan of of the genre and of sci-fi and but also as attentive if not more attentive to the emotional to the emotional reality that her characters find themselves in and it was a really you know just to see her to see her work and work with her was was a pleasure so i owe it to her and i should talk about um before i forget natalie holt natalie holt's score is s- extraordinary composer. it's just it's like i kind of wish i'd had that before we started <laughs> it was like yes this is the sound this is loki this is what loki sounds like this kind of it's got some flair and Mm -hmm. some theatricality and some bombast and it's sort of uh it's it announces itself with confidence but there's also these very unusual I guess motifs or themes that recur through the course of the the series and and there's a she I think there's a the theremin this this kind of unusual instrument she plays and yeah she her contribution has just elevated the entire thing so exciting as well because she's such a, a a new you know composer in terms of you know she's worked across some incredible projects and stuff but it's it's so brilliant that you know I think that that's something that that Kevin Feige kind of really does in terms of when he's working on the right team to work on you know the productions yeah. and with the specific characters you know when you think yeah. of putting Taika on Thor Ragnarok and what that did yeah. to I mean he, you Absolutely. know it's just it's and you can tell that he really cares about what these characters do and who he puts, you know, with these projects and with these characters Absolutely. as well. And in terms of of the team that he's put together for, for this behind the scenes, you know, particularly with with Kate and Natalie, it's just it's extraordinary. And two women as well. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's great. And I there's a strange connection I have with Natalie, which is that she she worked on Wallander for the BBC. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, oh wow! It's kind of amazing. That's lovely. What a lovely kind yeah. of kind of full circle. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy to think, isn't it, that if if they hadn't listened to those, you know, those kind of test screenings way back, that we wouldn't be here now talking about the series in, in the terms yeah. of that, you know, he he wasn't originally supposed to be a character that that went through this journey that that has, you know, longer than most of them to be honest, sort of thing. But amazing that they listened to the fans. Yeah, they do. They and they they understand the relationship is is a two way street. You know, yeah. they, they they make these movies for the fans and understand that yeah. the, the the stories and the characters uh, they mean so much to so many people for lots of different reasons. And and um, it's hugely generous, I think. And they're so diligent in in their attention. They really listen. Mm. I have that the, the fans and the audience to thank to whoever's in that test screening um, for, <laughs> for Thor The Dark World. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing to have a screening, another screening with everyone who was originally in that screening room? That would be awesome. Yes. That would be so yeah. cool. <gasps> yeah. Oh. 
so yes, that Thor the Dark World was was once upon a time my last destination. But yeah, whoever's in that room. Thank, thank God. Yeah, yeah, thank God. Um, right, let's talk about you in music specifically, because yeah. I, I know how much you you love the art form of, you know, of of creating basically, you know, whether that's yeah. film or TV or theater. Um, yeah. you know, and you studied as well, but at, at what point and, and and it's probably way before that, did was music something that you, you know, we talked earlier about the power of it, but something that you recognized the the power of it and and what it what it could be, you know, it could be simply putting a piece of music on to enjoy, but also there's there is a lot more that it does offer. I think it was sort of I must have recognized that it made me feel something and it made me feel it made me feel something in a, in a way that was, it was like it was reflecting something about myself back to me that I hadn't fully become aware of. And it probably was from, I loved music as a child. Do you play anything? I, pl- I play a uh, few things very badly. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I play the piano a little bit um, and I play the, the guitar. guitar. You learn to play the guitar, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I also once upon a time played the trumpet, but my embouchure has completely uh, have lost it <laughs> completely. Um, but when I was ten, I played the last post on Remembrance Sunday at school. Oh wow! Um, and uh, loved doing that. But I remember I can actually even as you asked that question, I remember once on a on a trip somewhere across across this country. I might be even in, even in Scotland. We were listening to Simon and Garfunkel on the way, and there's the the end of that, the end of the boxer, is really it has a suddenly it suddenly kind of orchestral, like all these strings come in. There's it just it opens up from just being an acoustic guitar to being something a much more sophisticated arrangement. I think the same thing happens on Bridge Over Troubled Water. It just suddenly gets bigger. It stops just being piano and it gets a, it gets bigger. And I it was sort of, I was like, oh, I'm feeling, what, what am I feeling? I'm feeling things. <laughs> and um, so that was, a, that was definitely like a, a light bulb going off about the power of music to evoke uh, feeling. And then really just in my teens, probably, you know, because I'm, I'm very old now. Um, I remember going to uh, uh, trying to find soundtracks because soundtracks weren't easy to get and you had to go to so HMV hard. and you had to go to like, they were never on display because it was always pop and, and rock and da, 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 and you'd have to go to the basement and there was like a little corner at the back of HMV <laughs> with the soundtracks. And I'd be like, I want to find Last of the Mohicans or I want to find amazing. Shawshank Redemption. Because I, I remember watching The Last of the Mohicans I must have been about 11 or 12. And I knew that the, there was something about the combination of Michael Mann and Dante Spinotti's cinematography, although I wouldn't have probably known their names back then. Dan, mm-hmm. Daniel De Lewis's performance, the locations and that score.
I was like, I'm feeling really ancient things here and I'm only 11. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was really trying to seek out. And I used to have this double tape deck where I would try and find, and I realized, I suppose that was unusual. Like my friends didn't have soundtracks in their CD collections, but then maybe it was the same for you. I just, I just was always interested by film music and became really aware of it and started listening out for it. It was the Jungle Book for me, weirdly, in terms of that kind of sort of New Orleans jazz kind of thing. And I remember hearing a, a jazz band play it live in my mum and dad's little hotel. It, there was something about that experience that made me kind of almost not separate the music from the pictures from that point on, but more kind of pay a bit more attention to it. Absolutely. And, and it was What's um, really strange. Sorry, I, I'll let you finish. No, 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 go, no, 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 I'm done. I'm done. Go. Well, I, I, if when, when I auditioned for drama school, you have mm -hmm. to do a classical piece, a modern piece, and you have to sing a song. And I sang The Bare Necessities. No. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, because you have to sing it without accompaniment. And I was like, I think I can pull this one off. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, wasn't going to go for anything with too high. You know, I think too high in the tenor range, but I sang that. Yeah, Phil Harris. Wow. Legend. Look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your stress. I mean the bare necessities or Mother Nature's recipes that bring the bare necessities of life. Wherever I wander, wherever I roam, I couldn't be found off my big home. The bees are buzzing in the tree to make some honey just for me. When you look under the rocks and plants and take a glance at the fancy ants, then maybe try a few. The bare necessities of life will come to you. They'll come to you. Oh, man, this is really living. Wow. But yeah. that's pressure. That is pressure. I mean, what if you're like the most amazing actor, but you just don't have the voice? You're that's looking hard. at it. <laughs> oh, come on. We <laughs> heard it. We heard it. No, we no, heard no. it. But it's I suppose I suppose the uh I suppose it's maybe it was a test of of like just committing to because they used to actually teach us at, at, at drama school even if you don't have I mean I was at drama school people who were absolutely gifted and sang mm -hmm. like angels and I was aware I was really like you know behind the pace and and I was never going to get there I just didn't have the instrument um but this the, the actually the, the lesson I learned is you just have to commit to the story of the song and that mm -hmm. will kind of guide you so even if you can't sing like Freddie Mercury or, 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 or whoever it is, you know, you, you just kind of commit to the song and what the song's trying to communicate and somehow that will carry you through. Yeah. Can we what talk a little I bit about I Saw, I saw the Light? Because um, sure. I thought your performance in that was, was just really beautiful and it's really interesting insight into, his, you know, a character study really in terms of, of I didn't really know that much about his life. I just, yeah. I remember growing up hearing his songs, you know, my granddad loved, loved Hank Williams. And, but, but yeah, in terms of the preparation for a, a role like that, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a different type of learning involved, isn't there? Is that a oh nice challenge? Maybe the biggest challenge ever. I think for me, uh, and, and a sort of a real a sense of responsibility about trying to get as close to getting it right as I could. And, and because he, Hank, you know, that, that, what I learned about people like Hank, anyone in that position could be Bob Dylan or Amy Winehouse, you know, any, people who, who write, compose, sing and perform their own songs. It's something it is so raw and so exposing mm -hmm. and yeah. as actors we're interpreting or we're interpreting and collaborating all the time but 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 those kinds of artists are just you have to be you're so vulnerable because that's your words and and I had this amazing teacher I think we've talked about this called uh, Rodney Crowell who's this extraordinary musician and, and songwriter in his own right and he loved Hank Williams he remembers seeing Hank Williams on his father's shoulders at the age of two. Um, and uh, I'm like, I hope I've got that right. But he, he sort of grew up in that tradition of um, that genre of music in America. And he taught me, he said, Tom, you're not going to be able to 
get inside this by any kind of imitation. What you have to try to work out is what these songs mean to you. If you take these lyrics, like I'm so lonesome, I could cry, or that's a, you know, a very sad song or, or something really sort of upbeat, like, Hey, good looking, <laughs> find out what these songs mean to you first and sing them for yourself. And then we can figure out how to get, how to modulate the tone oh, amazing, and, and change, you know, sort of change the timbre of your voice and stuff. And that was when I was like, wow, this is going to be exposing. Okay. I have to, you have to make a different sort of commitment. about cooking something up with me said hey sweet baby don't you think maybe we could find us a brand new recipe i got a hot rod ford and a two dollar bill and i know a spot right over the hill there's soda pop and the dancing free so if you want about cooking something up with me it's incredible when you look at the incredible collection of directors that you've worked with and then the composers that have been part of those you know productions whether that be Spielberg and, and John Williams or uh, Guillermo del Toro or, or you know or, or even on the night manager as well which is incredible with Suzanne and composer on that but for me one of my favorites has got to be the the kind of Ben Wheatley and Clint Mansell collaboration and also so just great. the the, the soundscape and score around laying in that character. And I just wondered if there was if there was any music for you connected to that character in your in your prep or while you were whilst you were filming it. I remember I think there was that I think he said that there, you remember there was a there was a, a cover of SOS in the film. Yeah by Portishead, yeah. Portishead, yeah. 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 And that they had sent before we started filming, they had sent a sort of early an early sort of mix of what it might be and Ben played it to me and oh, it wow. was just like okay here we go yeah it's um, so good isn't it yeah it's got this you know what they did with that song and also we were so thrilled that that ABBA were, were, had given us the permission to do it and uh it's so haunting it's haunting and enigmatic and um it sort of was a, a real key into sort of the the enigma of of what Ballard was trying to do with that story, because the way he wrote the book is he's got this clinical detachment um, in the way he writes about the characters and the, and the slow and steady demise of the building and 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 the society that they have constructed. Anyway, and so it was, I, it was definitely that track. I used to play that on the way in. <laughs> yeah, perfect. And um, listen, we've run out of time. I feel like we just scratched the surface, but I. Can't thank you enough for this. It's so great to chat to you. Um, and I can't wait to watch the rest of the episodes of Loki as well. So great to see you, Tom. Lovely to see you. Thanks for having me. Where are those happy days? They seem so hard to find. I tried to reach for you, but you have closed your mind. Whatever happened to our love? I wish I understood It used to be so nice It used to be so good So when you near me, darling Can't you hear me, S.O.S.? From High Rise, that's Portishead's cover of SOS by ABBA, which I very much hope 
Mr. Jeff Barrow is happy with us playing. I'm rounding off this latest episode of Soundtracking with Tom Hiddleston. If, like us and my partner in crime, Ben, you will have also sort of properly gone deep into a 90s electronic wormhole after listening to Portishead. And what a wonderful thing that is to do as well. My huge thanks to Tom for taking the time to talk to us. Loki is available to watch on Disney Plus now with episodes streaming weekly and is another excellent addition to the TV spin-offs from the Marvel comic universe. Now we will put up a playlist, Spotify playlist for the show via edithbowman.com which is also the place to catch up with all of our previous outings including my chats with the Russo brothers and Taika Waititi and also the previous episodes with Ben Wheatley and there's another one of those to come. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and please do check out our YouTube page too where I suspect you might find this interview with Tom at some point in the not too distant future. Yes, I will share that with you in the next couple of weeks. Next up, I'm really looking forward to sharing a chat that I did with Nick Broomfield last week who is a documentary filmmaker that we've had on the show a couple of times actually. But what's really interesting is Nick has a film out in the cinemas for a very limited run called Last Man Standing. And it's really interesting because he delves back into a world that he's already explored over 10 years ago, looking at the deaths of Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls. So Last Man Standing is out in cinemas as of now. Go and check it out and then hear me chat to Nick on next week's show. I very much look forward to the pleasure of your company then. <laughs>